Good afternoon. This is the second NTSB on-scene press briefing regarding the derailment that occurred yesterday morning. I am joined by our investigator in charge, Mr. Jim Southworth, who's here with me. He's coordinating the activities of our investigative team. I'd like to begin by clarifying the role of the different agencies who are here. I know you heard from Captain Moore at 10 a.m. this morning from the Unified Command about their activities involved in the response and the remediation. They are handling all of the product recovery and evacuation decisions. They have expertise in those areas as well as air monitoring equipment and they are going to be making those decisions. The NTSB is an independent investigatory body. We're charged with investigating transportation accidents. We investigate accidents in all modes of transportation. We determine probable cause and we make recommendations. That's what we're here to do is to find out why this accident happened and how it happened so we can prevent future accidents from occurring in the future. We did have some preliminary access to the scene yesterday. We discussed some of what we saw there with you, but we are gonna continue to defer to the Coast Guard as well as the Incident Command for site monitoring to ensure that it's safe to get our investigators back on scene. And where, when they can do that, they will be doing additional measurements, documentation, and evaluating uh, the equipment and the failure mechanisms and how the uh, derailment occurred and where the point of derailment was. Last night, we held our organizational meeting, the IIC designated parties to the investigation. The current parties to our investigation are Conrail, the Federal Railroad Administration, Trinity, the manufacturer of the tank car that was breached, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen, and the United Trainmen's Union. We may be adding additional parties, other groups are en route, and we're also working very closely with many federal, state, and local partners that may be named as parties later. I'd like to recognize the excellent cooperation that we have received from the local officials, the local emergency responders, and the state DEP officials, as well as other groups like the state police. The state police went up this morning, they took some aerial shots of the accident site for us so we can begin to do some of our documentation and evaluation of our next steps. I'd like to give you a little bit of information about the train, about the consist of the train. The train departed Camden, New Jersey at 3 a.m. en route for Kearney's Point, New Jersey. The derailment occurred at approximately 7 a.m. The train was being pulled by two CSX locomotives and the train consisted of 68 loaded cars and 14 empty cars. The length of the train was 4,915 feet, and on board was a locomotive engineer and a conductor. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the cars that are involved in the derailment. The first car that derailed, that is turned over on its left side, is a covered hopper car that was filled with plastic pellets. The seventh car in the consist was carrying lumber. That car is also overturned on the land side. And these cars are positions after the locomotives, after the two locomotives. The sixth and the seventh cars are overturned on the land side. The eighth car is a tanker carrying ethanol. That car is derailed and off the bridge and partially in the water. The 9th, 10th, and 11th cars all were carrying tanker cars carrying vinyl chloride and they are in the water. The 12th car is also carrying vinyl chloride. It's derailed, but it's on the bridge. And the 13th car remains coupled to the 12th car. It's upright, it's on the rails, it did not derail and it's on the bridge as well. So in summary, 
seven cars derailed, and four are in the water. The cars that derailed were again in positions six through 12. The breached car was in position number 10. The breached car has an impact hole near the center of the tanker, and it, the hole is approximately one foot by three feet. The tanker was built by Trinity Industries in 1990. It's a class 105 DOT tank car, and the tanker was carrying between 23 and 24,000 gallons of product. Yesterday, the two locomotives were cut, were cut from the train and moved to Paulson Yard by the train crew after the derailment. Our investigators went to take a look at those locomotives. They performed a class one inspection of the locomotives and a brake test of the locomotives. No defects or exceptions were noted. We've also downloaded recorders from those two locomotives and our team are working to verify and validate the approximately 12 parameters that are on those recorders. They will give us things like speed, throttle position, braking, and whistle and horn. Early information indicates that the train was traveling approximately eight miles per hour when the emergency brakes applied and the train derailed. We're gonna talk a little bit about the infrastructure or the track. This track is owned, maintained, and dispatched by Conrail. There is a signal on the south, uh, on the north side of the bridge. This train was traveling in a southbound direction. It was traveling over a movable or a heel end swing bridge. The bridge is approximately 200 feet long and there is a speed limit for the trains that cross this bridge of 10 miles per hour. We're in the process now of obtaining records from Conrail regarding the most recent inspections inspections of the track, inspections of the bridge, the signals, and the inspections of the bridge that we're interested in are the mechanical inspections of this operation of the movable bridge, the swing arm, structural inspections of the bridge, and also underwater inspections of the supports for the bridge. There are requirements for each of these types of inspections. The track is to be inspected weekly. The, the bridge is to be inspected quarterly and annually, depending on the type of inspections. And the underwater inspections are to be conducted once every five years. We're working with Conrail now to obtain the records of how and when those inspections were performed. Today, our team is conducting interviews of the crew. We had early written statements but today they are interviewing the engineer, the conductor, and the dispatcher. We've had some early conversations with them as they're in those interviews, and they've shared some information about what the crew experienced as they approached the bridge. There's a conductor and an engineer in the head end of the front locomotive. They approach the movable bridge. There's a signal there. They see a red signal, a stop signal, as they approach the bridge and they see that the bridge is closed. This is an unusual position for them to see the bridge in at that time. They would have expected to see the bridge in an open position. And what we mean by open is that it's open to the recreational vessel traffic in the waterway. As they approach the bridge, generally they will put in, so they will key in on their radio a signal to close the bridge. So when they approached the bridge, they had a red signal and the bridge was in the closed position. They keyed in the signal that they need to send to the bridge, looking for a clear signal, looking for a green proceed signal on the bridge. They didn't get that. The conductor got out of the train, 
He did a walking inspection. He returned to the train, told the locomotive engineer that everything looked good. The locomotive engineer attempted to key in the signal three more times, but he did not get a green or proceed signal. He called dispatch over the radio and he received approval to cross the bridge and pass that red signal. Two locomotives and several cars had cleared the bridge. They were on the other side of the bridge when the crew stated that they saw the bridge collapse and the train went into emergency braking application. We are continuing to question the crew um, to get additional information as well as interview crews who may have traversed the bridge in the days prior to the accident. And so we still have some work to do, but I wanted to share with you some preliminary information that we'd obtained from those interviews. We are aware and we've been talking with Conrail about the 2009 collapse that occurred over Labor Day weekend. We do know that they had um, some support structural issues associated with the bridge. There was a failure. There was a coal train that derailed. The bridge was closed for approximately two weeks while they did rebuilding. And we are looking now to see the records of what was done, how it was done, and how it's been inspected. We're also aware that Hurricane Sandy affected this area and came through here. And so we are going to be looking for information about how that area and how the bridge may have been affected by any rising water. In this area, there are about four to eight train movements across this bridge per day. And as I mentioned, we will be looking to interview other crews who might have crossed the bridge in the days prior to the accident and other maintenance crews who may have been working in the area and any inspections that have taken place. As you can tell, our team is very busy. We're eager to get access to the site, but first, all of the remediation activities need to take place to make sure that the product is safely removed from the tankers and that we can get on scene and do our work. But we have a lot to do with interviews and collecting information from Conrail, from the railroad, as well as the individuals who are involved. We'll be working to do that, and we expect that our next update will be tomorrow. And if you follow us on our Twitter account, you'll be kept apprised of that. If there's any new information that we need to release immediately, we will call another press briefing before then. But for now, we'd expect our next briefing to be tomorrow. I'm happy to take questions. The piling to the bridge, what is the material? Maybe it's wood or steel, concrete? There are questions about the materials used in the construction of the pilings of this bridge. That is all information that we're going to have to take a look at. We did receive some preliminary information last night from the Conrail team that when the bridge failed in 2009, that they had rebuilt the bridge and some of the pilings were encased in concrete, but we really need to take a look at the structural drawings and do a physical inspection of the bridge. You've spoken 12 minutes about inspection, but you haven't spoken about the cleanup. Cleanup is an out of sight, out of mind, it's long term effect. And that's just As I mentioned in the beginning of my remarks, the NTSB is here to investigate the transportation accident. We are deferring all questions regarding response, remediation, cleanup to the Unified Command. They did provide a briefing at 10 o'clock this morning, and I expect that they will continue to keep the community informed. Again, we're communicating and coordinating with them, but we are uh, taking the lead in the accident investigation, and they are taking the lead in the areas where they have expertise with monitoring, air quality, and remediation. In your experience, what's an estimated timeline for a type of investigation? The question was, how long do our investigations usually take? Oftentimes, when there are hazmat releases, it will take a little bit longer time to do our work on scene because of the uh, efforts that need to take place to remediate the product. And so we will be here on scene for as long as it takes. Generally, we're on scene for about a week. It could very much be longer on this one, depending on how the cleanup goes. It usually takes us approximately a year to release our final investigation report. We'll release a preliminary report in a couple of weeks. If there are any safety issues that we identify, 
we will issue safety recommendations at any time. In your interviews, was it established that there have been previous incidents where attempts to cross the bridge against the red signal were not responded to by the radio and that they asked the dispatcher for clearance and they received clearance to cross the bridge? The question is, have previous crews approached the bridge and seen a red signal and had to go to dispatch to get clearance to cross the bridge? Those are exactly the kinds of questions we'll be looking at when we're looking at prior crews who might have crossed this bridge. We have requested that all of the dispatch tapes, the radio tapes, be preserved so we have the opportunity to review those. And we're working with Conrail to obtain that information and go through it in the coming days. What will be taking place today on site? product from the cars? The question, the question is what will be, ta be taking place at the accident site today. We really will defer to the incident uh, command activities. They are working now with contractors, with the railroad, with the EPA, with Coast Guard to try to figure out how to safely uh, remove the product from those cars. And they will make decisions on how that moves forward. We want to make sure that the site is safe certainly for our investigators, but for the community before we proceed with any of our activities. When you talk about the, the locomotive, um, and you, you said it, I might have missed some of it, about what, you can, what they have with the clean and everything. Would you refer to that as a black box? What would you refer to that as? The question is, the information that we're able to obtain from the locomotive, uh, how, we, how we obtain that. Um, there are recorders on the locomotive. These are data recorders. And we expect that there are probably about 12 parameters that may be recorded. Our team has downloaded information from both of the locomotives and they're working to correlate all of that information to make sure it's accurate. And we would expect to find things on there like speed. An early audition of that information, just a preview of it, indicates that the locomotive was traveling about eight miles per hour when it went into emergency braking. That is consistent with the information that we received about a 10 mile per hour speed limit across the bridge. And the train had been stopped at the signal at before the bridge, and they had proceeded across the bridge when the emergency braking took place. Would you have one more question? Thank you all very much. We will be back uh, tomorrow, and we'll let you know when that briefing will take place.